Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandhya Ramachandran. I am a rising senior at Georgia Tech and also the WOA National Panels Chair. I am honored to be the moderator for today's panel. The past couple of months in our country have done nothing but shed just a small light on the racial injustices that our peers, colleagues, and friends face every single day of their lives. As we are mourning the loss of so many Black lives, we need to remind our communities that Black lives matter. The goal of this panel today is to have these difficult but necessary conversations about race in the aerospace industry and provide insight on the problems that many Black students, researchers, scientists, and engineers still face today. No matter where we come from or the color of our skin, we must come together to fight the racial injustices experienced by many and continue to address these situations with those around us. With that being said, I am honored and privileged to introduce to you several astounding individuals who will serve as our panelists for today. First up, we have Major General Bolden, who is a former NASA Administrator, a retired United States Marine Corps Major General, and a former astronaut who flew on four space shuttle missions. A veteran of four space flights, he has logged over 680 hours in space. In 2009, President Obama appointed Major General Bolden to be the administrator of NASA. Major General Bolden was the first African-American to head the agency on a permanent basis. The agency's dynamic science activities under General Major Bolden include an unprecedented landing on Mars with the Curiosity rover and the launch of a spacecraft to Jupiter. Today, Major General Bolden serves as the president and CEO of the Bolden Consulting Group, LLC. Next up, we have Georgia Tech graduate student, Naya butler -Kart. She is an aerospace engineering PhD student at Georgia Tech High Power Electric. Every Riddle Aeronautical University with a concentration in astronautics and a minor in computational math. She is currently a Pathways intern at NASA Glenn Research Center. Next up, we have Aaliyah Fleek. She is a rising junior at Harris Stowe State University, double majoring in aerospace and computer engineering. She is originally from Kansas City, Missouri. Aside from being a student, Aaliyah is involved with various clubs on campus, including the National Council of Negro Women and the National Society of Black Engineers. Off campus, she spends her time participating in the Divine Daughters, a mentorship program focused on helping young women see their potential internally and help live their lives from the inside out. Currently, Aaliyah is interning at Lockheed Martin's Adv Advanced Space Systems Program. Last but not least, we have Kaylin Borders, who is a rising junior at San Diego State University, majoring in aerospace engineering. She is originally from the Washington, D.C. area, but spends most of her time on the West Coast for her studies. At school, she participates in the Supplemental Instruction Program, where she leads two peer-assisted learning sessions a week for the Physics Mechanics courses. Aside from her studies, she is an active member of several clubs on campus, including the Women in Science Society, Women of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and the National Society of Black Engineers. Currently, Kaylin is an intern at the Naval Research Laboratory's Spacecraft Engineering Department, where she has been interning for the past three years. Please give a warm welcome to all of our panelists. We will begin the panel with a question from the audience under the theme of microaggressions. So the first question is, what are some of the most common microaggressions you have experienced? And what do you think is the best way to address them when they occur? I think you're muted, there we go. Yeah, did you wanna direct that to any one of us specifically or is that for all of us to jump at it? All of you guys can jump at this one. <laughs> I'll defer to the women. Go ahead and start. Um, one I've recently I've encountered, I think as of just last year, I was told verbatim that I was more likely to get job opportunities because I'm a black girl. Um, I, I was told that by a white man. Um, and so I think a lot of the most common ones and I think who people think are innocent, are basically affirmative action microaggressions, basically saying that uh, my job prospects are, are better just because of my skin color and my gender. Um, the other half of that microaggression is 
addressing me as a girl instead of a woman. When um, if I'm in a if I'm in the same place working with you, I'm I should be your colleague. I'm not your subordinate. Um, and so I think those are two things that um, may slip under the radar a lot, um, where you have a colleague maybe addressing you as not you know they're equal, um, as well as affirmative action comments. So. Yeah, I can go next on that one. Definitely at the undergraduate level, affirmative action is a big one. People like to throw in your face. Um, it's not fun, especially I overheard a conversation my freshman year, um, a girl talking to some of her colleagues, and um, I guess one of her parents were from South Africa. And so because of that, well, she was a white woman, though. And because of that, she would talk. She'd be like, yeah, you know, I would put African-American on my transcripts and things like that. So I would, you know, be sure to get in. And I'm like, you know, that's not really what, you know, that's there for. And so it's sad that people see that as a way that we are just guaranteed placement in certain places when that's not the case at all. And so I wish people would kind of see that as, you know, how many black students are actually actually go to your school? You know, is affirmative action, don't use that as a kind of excuse when out of the lecture hall of 100 students, there's only three black students. So that's not what it is. So I think people really need to dial back down on just the unconscious things they say about that. I'd, I'd add um, the microaggression doesn't stop in school. You know, I as the NASA administrator, one of the things I used to enjoy, I, I, I didn't, uh, NASA is not a cabinet level office. So, so the administrator was not a cabinet official, but, but President Obama was, really, he was really special because he loved science and, and he loved STEM kind of things. And so I'd frequently get over, get invited over to the White House for meetings and I'd walk in and um, in spite of the fact that President Obama had a cabinet and a, a, a staff that was pretty well representative, when I would walk into most of the things that were technically oriented, the room would be dominated by whites. And, uh, and I'd walk in and people would look at me who did not know me. And they, you know, you could see in their eyes this question of why, are, who are you and why are you here? And uh, I am not one who likes to talk about, you know, what I do or anything else. So I'd take my seat. And usually as we went around the room and I'd get introduced, all of a sudden you could look into the eyes of some of the same people that wondered who are you and why are you, why are you here? All of a sudden they wanted to talk to me and and they wanted to, you know, find out, how, tell me how much they love NASA and everything else. So it it happens. It will continue to happen throughout your lives. The biggest thing is just uh, as I try to tell young young women, particularly, but minorities in general, don't ever waste your time trying to explain to somebody why you're in the room. You know, just do your job and do it incredibly well, and uh, you'll you'll earn the respect of people that are worth it. There are some who are never going to accept you and you don't need to waste your time on them. Uh, you know, other people will, will take them down over time. So, but, but it, it lasts throughout your career. If that is all for that question, then I'd like to move on to the next one. So going off of these microaggressions that you guys have experienced, what experience have you had with reporting such microaggressions or experiences with racism to HR or campus services? Should these events be reported or is it better to address them directly with the perpetrator? Let me start again because I've, um, I've almost, in fact, other than, um, reporting a, you know, a bias incident when I first came into the Marine Corps. I, I, was, I was actually arrested uh, shortly after receiving my commission from the Naval Academy when my wife and I were, were uh, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and we were, we were the guest of my uncle who, who worked at, he was a maitre d' at the Ocean Forest Hotel in Myrtle Beach. And uh, back then it was segregated, but he had managed to work with management and got us a suite uh, you know, in one of the bungalows at, at the Ocean Forest Hotel, which was pretty ritzy. And uh, while we were driving around town, we had an incident occur and the two of us were arrested. And, uh, and we were actually, he was driving and it was something about the driving that, that, that caused it to happen. And I did not want to leave him. So I went along with him and we spent the night in, in the Myrtle Beach jail in a, in a cell full of people somewhere in there for murder and other kinds of things. And it was the way that we retreated 
uh, both in, in, in the, the arrest being made and while we were in there that uh, when I finally got out, I filed a civil rights complaint through the Office of Civil Rights at Shaw Air Force Base in uh, Sumter, South Carolina. Now, this is a long time ago. This is a lifetime ago. But, but the end result was um, an investigation was done. An apology was issued from the Department of Defense to the Myrtle Beach Police Department for my uh, actions. And nothing ever happened to me. In fact, the incident was kind of expunged from my record. I think so the Department of Defense wouldn't have to deal with it. And it, it always came out because early in my career, you know, when you fill out all of your forms and they ask if you've ever been arrested and stuff, I'd always say yes. And then I'd give them this long explanation of what had happened. And finally, somebody said, look, just stop putting it in your record. The, the DOD has, has just gotten rid of it because they don't want to talk about it. And uh, so I, I, that was the only time that I filed a complaint and it didn't work back then. Frequently, having now been in, in leadership levels at the top of NASA uh, and at the top of the Marine Corps, I found that unless the commander, unless the person in charge lets it be known that it is a, you know, it, it's their personal interest in seeing that, that, uh, that diversity is appreciated, that we won't tolerate uh, discrimination and the like, uh, it continues to go and people get frustrated in filing complaints and frequently will just won't, won't file the complaint and won't even address the individual. But my advice is always address the individual that has brought it out privately, but then formally uh, file the complaint because it, it really needs to be on the record. Um, I completely agree. I've personally been through the reporting process of a microaggression and it was not one of my choice. Honestly, I didn't, I didn't actually choose to report because I was honestly nervous. I had just started working at that uh, agency and um, I, I, I felt like it was dealt with in the moment due to me having an ally uh, with me. Uh, the ally that I had, she was a white woman, she was my uh, supervisor at the time and she stepped in and totally handled it. So I didn't feel like I needed to go further, um, but uh, it ended up going further uh, because other people thought that it should. And reporting can be very isolating and not fun, <laughs> um, just due to the fact that you know um, if, if this person has power over you in some way, you can you, you can fear the loss of job, retaliation, all that kind of stuff. Especially like you know, uh, General Bolden said, if the organization does not place value on diversity or equity, inclusion, all that good stuff, um, you know, some negative things can come about. But I am really glad that it was reported because I think it shined a light that um i guess on that group that they needed to do something about you know training unconscious bias training for their employees because um i think that was the first time that it happened there and maybe it wasn't maybe i was just the first time to report it so i definitely agree with that advice yeah just going off of that i definitely agree with me personally it hasn't since being at a campus i've definitely experienced stuff where people might say stuff in a group of friends and it's just awkward. And it's like, uh, you know, you really shouldn't say that, but you know, like you two were saying earlier, if this organization, this campus doesn't place, you know, diversity inclusion, like if it doesn't say that on the forefront, people are really just going to go about their day and say whatever they want to say. And so it's kind of, especially on a campus where it's like, you know, do whatever it's hard to kind of like be like, Oh, you shouldn't say that or uh, like that's kind of rude but hopefully now you know with everything going on it'd be much easier to report and people will be more cautious to say things out of character like that Aliyah, while you're forming your thoughts there because it looks like you're 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 shaping to say something so i don't want to keep you from saying it but let me add one more thing you know i'm the i'm the only uh what, did, what the heck is my generation? I'm, I'm, people my age are what? What are we? The uh, baby boomers. I, mean, I think we're the, probably the first generation that they ever, ever gave a name to, but I'm a baby boomer. And what I, I, you all need to know is Gen Z's or whatever you, whatever classification you are, you are incredibly inspirational to baby boomers like me. Um, and you have given, believe it or not, I can only speak for myself, but I think you've given us courage to stand up, you know, and, 
and say we've had enough. Um, it is just I live in the in the D.C. area, and so and I ride a bicycle, so I spend a lot of time on the Mount Vernon Trail, either going south or, or a couple of times a, a week I'll go into D.C. and I always go by Black Lives Matter Plaza to see the people there, and I can remember when the demonstrations were really going strong. A, a little girl that was about she looked like she was maybe five or six, and she had a a placard, and the placard said, the system is not broken. Uh, this is the system the way it was designed. And that just, that just struck me. And, um, you know, I believe that your generation is not going to stop. You're not going to lay down, and you're not going to do like we did. Uh, you know, my generation kind of battled for a while, and then we went away. Um, I, I now tell people, I use the term, I'm an angry black man. And, uh, and, and my white friends ask me frequently, well, what should we do? I say, I don't have a clue. I didn't create this problem, you did, and you need to fix it. I am willing to work with you to fix it, but I didn't create it, so I can't fix it. I'm just angry about it right now. So, so I do wanna say, you know, Aaliyah, as you get ready to frame your question, uh, I wanna thank you all for, for the inspiration that you give to my generation to help us to speak out and stand up. I was just gonna say from my perspective, like attending HBCU, I haven't really experienced anything on campus, but this was my first summer entering the workforce. So it was kind of just like stepping on my pinky toes, like I don't really know like what to say, like I don't really know where I fit in, but it definitely like would help like looking forward into the future. Even um, my manager at Lucky, while this was going on, she had called me personally to make sure that I was okay. And she had let me know, like, you know, if you need to take off work for a few days to process everything, like, that's perfectly fine. I feel like that's really important to know in these professional settings, like, okay, I'm your ally, or I hear you and I see you, but I might not understand you. And I feel like that's really important, but I'm willing to understand. So we just need to create more spaces as far as companies and like workplaces to let people know, I may not personally deal with it, but I'm willing to listen and understand and be there for you. Thank you all for such insightful answers. So most of you guys mentioned how important it is to have an ally. So our next question is, if someone notices that another person has just experienced a microaggression, what are some good ways for someone to hold space for and offer support to the victim? just because I have experience, not because I want to take over the whole panel. <laughs> um, uh, in my experience with, you know, handling a microaggression and luckily having an ally right on hand, um, I think that the best thing she did was shut it down for me because, again, I was a little nervous. I just started working there. I didn't know how this individual could influence my opportunity for the rest of the summer. So I kind of froze, to be honest. Um, and so to have her step in and just kind of say, um, that's absolutely not appropriate. Um, and, and, and even she, she did that in public, which I, I think is necessary since the microaggression was done in public. I think everybody learned a lesson from that interaction. Um, but then she also handled it in, in private and just kind of reaffirmed that, you know, that was not okay to the perpetrator. And then she also validated my emotions toward that because, I mean, say I didn't have an ally, ally there um, and no one who understood that that was a microaggression too, I would feel like I was being unreasonable. And so a lot of people are gaslit when they endure those situations, they're told they're being too sensitive, they're told they're being pulling the race card, et cetera, et cetera. And so just to be validated in that, in that moment means a lot. And almost, it, it was actually really emotional for me because I didn't think she would understand, but she was able to jump in before I could. So um, I was super grateful for that. Yeah, I, I think going off of what Naya said, when people experience microaggressions, we feel alone, we feel isolated, and we feel kind of embarrassed. So having a space where someone comes in and shuts that down and lets people know publicly and privately like that is not okay, it kind of gets rid of that embarrassment and that isolation, and it helps me feel a part of this organization and it lets me know know that this organization prides in me. It, it wants me here. And it wants to make sure that while I'm here, 
on your property, on your campus, that you will make sure that I'm taken care of. You know, especially at school, you know, I pay money, lots of money to go here. And so, you know, when you're in the workforce, you know, I do amazing work for this place. And so it's nice to know that what I'm doing here is valued and that you care. So I think that's the most important part when it comes to allyship and being there for people. Hey, thank you so much for answering that in such detail. So the last question we have under the theme of microaggressions themselves, have you ever lost an opportunity or a connection because you were vocal against microaggressions or racism? There I go again. Oh, <laughs> I'll let General Bold. No, no, no. I was, I was going to say, I, because I asked, I get asked this question a lot and I, uh, honestly, I cannot think of a time when, um, when something happened adverse to me because I spoke out, uh, which may be surprising, but it may be that, um, you know, we think if we speak out, then it's going to limit opportunities and the like. But I, I think what my experience has shown is that if you have the courage to speak out, people begin to look at you as a leader and, uh, and they, they will come to you uh, because you had the courage to speak out. You know, and I'm a Marine and we have these three things, three principles that we call cardinal core values and they're honor, courage, and commitment. And when you all were talking about allies, one of the things that I try to teach my Marines all the time is uh, courage is is um, next to in, next to integrity and honor. I think courage is is one of those things that's really important. And it's not about taking a bullet or being willing to go into battle. It's being willing to stand up and be an ally for somebody that you see uh, being discriminated against. And and in the Marine Corps, we're talking dominantly about minorities and women, particularly women. And, and you know, explaining that. Uh, having courage means you will not sit idly by and watch a woman in your unit be harassed or be slighted or, or not be given an equal opportunity because she's a woman. And so, um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's really, really, really important. And that's one of the things that I've tried to do um, in, as I've grown up and gone through, uh, you know, through the various la layers of employment and then leadership. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Speaking out um, has definitely, uh, you know, helped help my leadership ability just because it, you'll find that when you do speak out, you typically aren't the only one. Um, and then just to kind of go off of that last question, I did forget to add that another way to be an ally, um, if somebody does decide to report something and you were there to see it, just um, I told you, it, it could be a very isolating process. You have to kind of prove what happened when there isn't much proof, but um, having somebody testify or just kind of be there for you during that process is a great way to be an ally. Um, and have I ever lost an opportunity? Um, not because that was vocal against microaggressions or racism, but I have lost opportunities due to being vocal against sexual harassment. And so we did talk about, you know, advocating for women in general, um, you know, um, in, in the workplace when they are being sexually harassed, that's another great way to protect people. Um, is to protect them from retaliation in certain situations. Since allyship has come up so much, I'll transition into some of the questions we got from the audience about that. So the first one is, what are some good examples of how allies can support you when you experience microaggressions at work? Can they call out the microaggression first or wait to follow your lead? My favorite current example is Bubba Wallace. And I don't know how many of you even know who Bubba Wallace is, but I, um, I grew up in, South, in, in the segregated South and, and car, you know, stock car racing was big when I was growing up because a lot of the that's the way that the way that blacks got into racing was a lot of them were moonshiners and which means they they drove illegal alcohol around and they were always trying to get away from the authorities and they became pretty good and so you saw 
we had our own little stock car circuit where blacks raced and everything, but you never saw too many blacks. In fact, you almost never saw a black get into NASCAR. And, uh, and now we have one of the top NASCAR races, racers is a young man, young black man by the name of Bubba Wallace. And, uh, uh, and it was interesting, there were, there were a number of, there was an incident of a noose hanging, uh, you, being used as the, as the pull for a garage door in his garage that he was assigned when NASCAR decided to come back to work. Of all people to deal with, and it wasn't really microaggression, it was macroaggression on the part of the president of the United States, you know, to go after Bubba Wallace because Bubba spoke out against the Confederate flag on the NASCAR circuit and, and demanded that he apologize for falsely accusing people of, uh, you know, about the noose in his, in his garage. When in fact, Bubba Wallace had nothing to do with the complaint. It was people who were his allies. It, there, were, there were mechanics and other drivers who came to his defense and said, this is not right. Um, and it was, it, I mean, it was, it was heartwarming to me personally, having grown up in the South, to see his fellow drivers push his car to the, you know, to the head of the, head of the stack in, um, in one of the earlier races this season. So um, I think that's the kind of things that we're gonna have to see. We're gonna have to see our white brothers and sisters as they are doing right now in all of these demonstrations. That's what makes it so much different than the 60s is that our white brothers and sisters are now beginning to understand that they are the problem or they're at least a part of the problem. And so they are becoming allies of ours. And I think that that makes it even more, more, much more, much stronger than it's ever been before. And I think it really frightens people because they see black and white uh, coming together to fight against wrong. And, and they're, they're, they're helping people to, to understand what we've been saying about this is not a, political thing, this is not a race or, or you know, um, party thing. It's all about right and wrong. And we've, we just have not been treated right. Yeah, coming off of that, um, definitely speaking out, um, like Naya was talking about earlier, where um, her allies spoke out in public and private, I think that public speak out is very important, especially going with NASCAR, because it lets not only you know, it lets the people around you know. It lets people around them know. It lets people around them know. It lets people know that what's going on is serious and it won't be tolerated. And I think that also at the end, it helps protect you as a person, because you never know what goes on in private, but with especially with public addresses, that helps you as the oppressed person situation, as the victim, it helps you more because it helps people around you see that, okay, this person is serious, she should be taken serious and that, you know, she can't be messed with or she shouldn't be messed with. And so it, I think it kind of helps people dial back down on anything that they might want to try in the future or might want to pull in the future. I'm just chiming in to say I totally agree. Definitely call it out and call it out loudly. <laughs> Thank you guys for that. So the next question is, how can non-colored people help make the work or educational environment better for colored people? I would say um, just ensuring that you're creating a safe place for your black colleagues and black peers because it's so easy to retweet something or to say you agree with the hashtag but you have to implement it in real life as well like with the whole black lives matter thing like everybody was woke for like maybe a good two and a half weeks and then all of a sudden like nobody was retweeting anything it was like well dang like what happened like you have to make sure like if this is what you stand for you're confident in what you stand for and that's just period, like nothing can change your mind or it's not just the trend, like this has to be something that you implement. Even if you're ignorant to it, like it's okay, just always like, even how we have this panel, there's always opportunities to learn. So just making sure they implement it in their real lives, that's definitely like the right way to go. Yeah, bouncing off of that, um, I know at my campus, well, I'm pretty sure at the campus, you have those small racial incidents that happen on campus. and 
what I found a lot sometimes with the people I'm around in my friend group, people in my dorm is people don't really want to learn. They don't really care sometimes. And it's like, well, this doesn't affect me. So it's like, oh, you know, I feel sad. I feel bad for you. But, uh, you know, you know, whatever. Or they don't or they aren't even aware of what happened. And so I think that being aware and just being open to listen, listen to me as a black person, why I'm upset, what are my concerns, and being able to learn, you know, learn about the history, learn about things that have happened in our past. You know, when it comes to history, a lot of people start at Martin Luther King. And it's like, no, there are people way before him. There are people way before him who have been just groundbreaking in race relations. And so I wish people would just go back, go back even farther. And I just, you can't leave it up to people on their own, you know, in institutions, in workplaces, in organizations. Don't be afraid to have those conversations, you know, keep going back and back and back. And I think that, I think if people do that, the education on the topic will follow. I recommend a movie that's called Harriet. Uh, you know, when you talk about going back a little bit farther than, than you know, this century and, and the last, um, go all the way back to the, to the time of slavery when, you, you know, you had uh, people who were brave enough to step up and, and try to help move people away from slavery, get them up into the North and the, and the like. And so uh, some phenomenal stories when you go back there that, that are stories of courage that hopefully will sustain us and, uh, and help us to understand that, you know, if people then were willing to risk their lives, um, we should be willing to speak out and, and, and you know, maybe put our jobs on the line uh, or something like that. But, but uh, there, are, there are tons of stories of bravery at, at the risk of one's life back in the earlier days. I totally agree. And just to jump off of what everybody said is like, take personal responsibility for educating yourself. Um, if, if Black people, if uh, people of color could fix the issues or things wrong with these institutions, they would have been fixed a long time ago. And so um, there just needs to be a lot of personal accountability and personal responsibility taken to educate yourself and, you know, take whatever action as an institution and as an individual that you need to do to um, be anti-racist and promote anti-racism. Absolutely. So what would you guys say is the most important thing to keep in mind as an ally when speaking out for or on behalf of a group that experiences racism in your workplace? Um, I would just have to piggyback off of even this last question, just making sure that you're stagnant in what you're standing for and making sure like you understand the fact that because you're an ally, you're essentially a shield for the person that you're standing up for and just making sure that you know, okay, if I know something is wrong to make sure that you call it out with no regrets at all. I have something short to say, just listen. Um, listen first, definitely listen before acting most of the time um, and don't center your experience or your voice over the actual marginalized people that you're trying to advocate for. Thank you guys so much. So now just looking at the aerospace industry itself, what barriers are there in creating an inclusive aerospace industry and what can we do to dismantle these barriers? Well, I'd say with the aerospace industry, a lot of people, it's tempting for people to just think about the science. So just think about the engineering and it's like, Yes, but you have to realize that there are a lot of different people here of a lot of different cultures that go through a lot of different experiences. And so just being aware and willing to listen and not kind of 
immediately shutting down someone when someone comes to you with a complaint or concern. You know, I think sometimes the things that I've experienced is like people just want to focus on science. They just want to focus on engineering, the technology, the innovation, what we're doing. And it's like, it's much, much more than that, especially situations like these, especially that happen over the summer, they affect people's mental health, their emotional health, what they can do in the workforce. It affects them. And so your employee or your colleague cannot perform to their best ability if things like these are things like this is going on. And so addressing that, letting, letting them know that you're here for them, that you're there for them, makes a world of a difference because we are more than engineers and scientists and, you know, astronauts and everything. We are still human beings. And so that needs to be taken into consideration. I was just going to say really quickly, um, another big problem is the picture on what an engineer looks like. So that also creates a space where it's like, okay, I know for me personally, like I had went to my first aerospace conference this past October and it was kind of just like, well, what am I doing? I had to like look around like, what am I doing here? Because I didn't feel like I fit in like at all, like at all. So I was just like, it was kind of like a culture shock as well. So just ensuring like that these spaces are also comfortable and we change that facade on what an aerospace engineer looks like and what an aerospace engineer is supposed to be, what type of background they're supposed to have because like Kaylin said, we're all different. We all come from different backgrounds. So just ensuring like you're creating these safe spaces for people, whether it's conferences, workplaces, like, and just being open to having these conversations. Uh, Aaliyah, you, you, um, what you just said struck me because it's, um, it's one of the things that I can constantly battle to try to get you and your generation uh to believe in yourselves and and not to question yourself you know you're you're you are that that's i didn't know what micro let me admit i did not know what microaggression was before before i got asked to be on this panel that was not that's not a term from the uh from from my generation but i did a little i did a little research and and one of the things that i think all of you have been victims of is uh, is one of the forms of of microaggression that's called micro invalidation, where people either in their statements or their actions or just their looks at you want to invalidate your uh, your right to be where you are. I want to invalidate your qualifications, and that's why I keep emphasizing: you all don't waste your time uh, trying to bear, trying to justify to somebody why you're there. Don't ever go into a room when you're the only person of color and wonder why you're there. Just go in, take your dog on seat, or go into the front. Always go up front, and uh, and start asking questions. And you know, be inquisitive. You know what your generation is like. You don't like to ask questions. You, no one wants to seem like they're the dumb one in the room. And and you're, you're like you're in high school again. But you cannot be afraid to break the ice. Uh, you know, make sure you're asking an informed question, but be among the first to ask that question and make, make, pe make people notice you in the room and make them understand that you're there because you belong there. And, uh, and, and you know, that's just don't let the, the micro invalidation uh, get you down. It, it's, it's never going away. That's why I talked about that was micro invalidation when I walked into the, you know, into, into the cabinet room in the White House. And people looked at me strange. They, they're trying to invalidate my being there. Uh, I wasn't worried about it. I knew why I was there. None of them were running the space agency. I was. And I was there because the president put me there. So, you know, I, you just can't, you can't, we cannot allow that kind of stuff uh, to, to keep you down the way it's kept my generation down. If my generation had done what you all are doing now, man, we'd be way ahead. We probably wouldn't be having these discussions. So it's really important for you all not to let anybody invalid, try to invalidate your being who you are. You're qualified or you wouldn't be here. Yeah, I agree with everything said, um, especially, you know, General Bolden. Um, I just wanted to go back a little bit to what Kaylin said about um, not being able to separate science and these any social issues because a lot of times these social issues will permeate science. There are a lot of there's a lot of history of racism in science. Um, example, Henrietta Lacks, 
um, have used her, the HeLa cells for some of the advancements and her family has not seen a cent of the, of the money that came from that. Um, even when we're talking about space and we talk about Mars colonization, you know, inherently colonization is a negative thing for people who have been colonized. Generations of people have been colonized. And so I think that oversight is an issue. Um, and bringing these things to the forefront now, um, I'm hoping we'll start to ch change the conversation about how racism and how these social issues affect science, not how they're not related because it's so clear that they are. It's clear to people like us. Um, and hopefully it's becoming more clear to people who don't look like us. Sandia, can I can I make a recommendation for for the audience? Really, um, you know, we're we're talking about things here in the U.S., but there are incredible examples across the world that uh, that might help us. Um, you know, our Arab brothers and sisters struggle, and uh, there is going to be a phenomenal event coming up next week. Uh, you know, the 14th, the United Arab Emirates is going to attempt to be the uh, you know the actually the second nation in history to send a mission to Mars on their first attempt. They're launching something that's called the Emirates Mars Mission. And, and it's, it's, its name it's, its name is Hope, uh, which I think is very appropriate. And they're trying to get it to Mars uh, in 2021 to help them celebrate the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Arab Emirates. I got in a lot of trouble for, for carrying out President Obama's outreach to the Muslim world uh, when I was the NASA administrator, but it was what he was trying to do was was help all of us understand that when we talk about science and math, uh, you know, we don't we don't use Roman numerals when we do calculations. We use Arabic numerals, and and the the, 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 the they came from exactly where the since the president likes to use you know words or or nationalities that it's it's Arabic, so they're Arabic numerals. They came from the Middle East. Uh, the abacus, uh, other things like that. But, but the importance of this mission coming up is the fact that there, in a place where no one expects women to be even participating, about 50% of, the, you know, of the, the leadership is female. And when you look at the science team on this mission, 80% of the scientists are female. And, um, and so we need to root for them uh, because they're, they're a part of the struggle that we're all involved in. Um, we need to root for our brothers and sisters who live in Appalachia, who happen to be white, uh, who don't have the financial wherewithal to do what, what their white brothers and sisters do and leave them behind. Because it's actually a struggle between the haves and the have-nots, or the wealthy and the not wealthy. And, and if we're going to recover from this, this terrible plight that we're in right now, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, what we're saying is everybody's life matters. But if we don't emphasize those of us of color, then we're never going to think about anybody else. So you got to fix us, help us get to where, you know, you've got to help us get equity if you're going to fix the whole problem. That, that's, that's what I was trying to say. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. So our next question asks, the aerospace industry is very closely linked to the military industrial complex, an inherently racist institution. How can we maintain our ties to these organizations while promoting anti-racism? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna jump in because uh, I, there, there, is, there is hope. And, uh, and I say that because I, I went back, I wanted to make sure I was, I was right. I have had the privilege of working with some incredible women uh, during my time in the military, uh, and it, particularly my eight years working for President Obama as the NASA administrator. And when I look back at aerospace, we still have a long way to go in terms of getting women and people of color into leadership positions in the major aerospace organizations. But you know, I looked at the top, at the Fortune 500 companies. And today, uh, there, there are one, two, three, four, more than five or six CEOs who happen to be female in Fortune 500 companies today. And people say, well, but it's out of 500 companies. But think about what it used to be. It used to be zero. 
uh, one of my very good friends, Dr. Wanda Austin, who used to head the Aerospace Corporation, is a woman of color. Uh, she became the first woman to ever be president at the University of Southern California. Uh, she was an interim before uh, Dr. Folt, who is now the first full-time president of the University of Southern California, you know, my graduate alma mater, but, but there is progress and, uh, and the aerospace community is, is being forced uh, actually to get on board. And, and again, but it's because of your generation pushing and pushing and pushing and some of you working to get promoted and move up in the, you know, up in the hierarchy of the organizations is gonna make it better. The Air Force just selected a, um, uh, or installed or coming up uh, the first ever uh, black chief of staff of the Air Force. And he picked the first ever woman to be the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. So uh, things are changing and, and they're changing really rapidly. The, the secretary of the Air Force today is a woman. So, um, you know, just, just keep pushing. Yeah, going off of that, and I'm really talking to myself when I say this, but like um, General Bolden was saying earlier, not being afraid to just keep going, no matter what. Go to the front of the room, ask the questions, because people that come after us depend on that. They depend on us putting our best foot forward now, no matter what the costs are, no matter what the risks are. And I always have to remind myself that, because there's times where, like you said, I feel micro invalidated. Like, I'm just like, oh, let me just chill in the back, stay calm. There's no people of color in here. There's no black people. There's no women. Let me just chill in the back, you know, stay calm, you know, write down all the questions that I have. Don't ask them, but just write them down, look them up later and just chill. But it's, I can't do that. I always have to remind myself, I can't do that because someone that comes after me is going to do the same thing. And then we're going to keep this cycle. But like he was saying earlier, it is up to our generation. So we have to just, no matter how we feel, consequences that may come, we just have to go to the front of the rooms, ask the questions, and not be afraid to be that one person. Because if I'm that one person, then there'll be two more after me. And then there'll be five more after me. And there'll be a hundred more after me. So that's, that's kind of what I took out of that. Thank you so much. What are some ways to better supply the STEM pipeline with students from diverse communities and diverse backgrounds? I'm going to jump right on this one. Um, so I honestly feel like the best way to get students is you have to start with these, these areas where the opportunities might not be as accessible. What I mean by that is these underfunded areas because even to bring it to a personal experience, the high school that I went to, I didn't even know what an aerospace engineer was. I didn't even know what I wanted to do when I went to school. So just starting that when we're young, like knowing like, okay, even with the micro validation, like if we get validation when we're in elementary school, like, you know, you can be a rocket scientist. Like if I had heard that when I was like five, I'm like, I don't know what that is, but I guess. But just having people that pour into you is just really important, especially in these communities where we don't see people that go to college, especially for me. I was the first person. I don't know my AirPods fell out. I was the first person to go to college in my family. So it was kind of just like shifting the dynamic was really hard. And because I didn't have anyone to look up to, what you see is what you're bound to be most of the time. And so if you don't see anybody doing things, it's kind of just like, okay, well, I don't really know like which way to go. But if we start like while people are in these under underrepresented communities, then it's like, okay, I kind of have a idea of the fact that I can go to college, even though no one in my family has been. So just starting there, like, instead of these areas where there's like, they have these phenomenal like STEM programs, or it's just like, oh, like, I wish I had that. But it's just like, the reality of it is there's not enough people in these communities that are willing to come out and implement like, you know, hey, I'm a first year college student as well. And I did A, B, C, and D. So just willing to be those voices for those people and also like, seeking opportunities for them as well. You know, Aaliyah, just what she just said is key. And the good thing is that when I when I look at all of you again and I and I, I read through your bios and the, the refreshing thing is that every single one of you is engaged in mentoring 
and trying to help people come up uh, to take your place or to join you or whatever it is. That's absolutely critical. And that's something that we all have to do. You know, Leah, Leah hinted about not knowing that things exist. I grew up, like I said, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and, and my home was, I, I grew up in a middle class uh, neighborhood, but, but as was typical, the railroad tracks ran behind my housing, behind my housing area, and, and I fell in love with trains when I was young. Uh, when people talked about an engineer, to me growing up, uh, you know, until I actually, until I was well into high school, when somebody said engineer, I thought they were talking about the guy in the front car on a train. I didn't know what it, I literally did not know what an engineer was, the kind of engineer that we're talking about in aerospace and, and you know, and other fields. And so we've got to share with young people, when you talk about filling the STEM pipeline, we have to let them know, we have to inform them, first of all. Uh, they can't aspire uh, to do things or be things if they don't even know they exist. And so one of the things that we need to do is you all need to share with them the experiences that you've had, the opportunities that you've had, so that they know that, yeah, there, there are engineers out there who are, are like me. They're, they're Black engineers and they're Black scientists, and I can do that also. So I, I think that's really key. When you, when you go out of this session, what can I do? I can let young people know that, yes, we are engineers. If you want to see what the face of an engineer looks at, wow. Well, you're looking at it, you know, so just not me, you all, but just just as my my baby granddaughter likes to go like this. So when somebody says, what's an engineer like, just go and let them know they're looking at one. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, I was on the opposite end of the spectrum, but in this, if, to support both of you guys' points, I went to a science and technology high school here in um, PG County. And in that high school, it had so many resources. It was kind of to the point where people didn't really take advantage of them, sadly, but it had so many resources. I mean, when we were seniors, you know, you got into this internship program and you were automatically guaranteed places at NIH, um, at, uh, what is it, the Agricultural Government Agency. I was able to get an internship at NASA just as, as a senior in high school. And they, we, we even had a NSBE chapter in our high school. like. They push STEM constantly. I do not know where I would be without that program. I mean, that program, going through the four years of that high school program, it's taught me so much about STEM. And it really makes me think, you know, hearing about Aaliyah, it's like, wow, like people don't have this. And it's like, people can't be what they don't know exist. And so really pushing, you know, the need for these programs, especially in the high school and middle school age where people kind of, you know, start to really have a feel for what they want to do. It's so important, I feel like, to start young. Yes, I, I totally agree with what everyone said. Um, I personally, I was not exposed to STEM until um, my senior year of high school <laughs> uh, too, but um, I think what was different about my story is I was just so curious that I would end up looking things up for myself. And then I didn't, I decided I wanted to be an aerospace engineer astronaut before I actually saw someone that looked like me doing it. And that person was Mae Jemison, um, who I stumbled upon completely. She was on a poster in my church's gym and I was like, oh my gosh, she exists. <laughs> it's like, whoa, my mind was completely blown. And um, and then obviously my mom saw that passion and she pushed me into a lot of STEM programs. So um, local ones in Orlando and uh, they helped me in a lot of ways. But I always wondered like, what if I saw Mae Jemison a few years earlier? You know, just what if I started a few years earlier? Who could I have been? What could I have done? Um, but luckily, what I'm what I'm really glad to see it, especially like even local to Atlanta, is there's so many opportunities for young black students um, and in a lot of areas here, um, just to get their foot in the door. I mean, there are kids who know like all the coding languages, and um, we actually have a high school student in my lab. If she's watching, Tykeria, shout out to you. She's incredible. She knows how to solder. She knows LabVIEW, and um, I, I just want to see more of that because. I mean, taking those skills in from that young, I, there's there's no telling how far you can go. Um, so, so I'll, you know, I'll challenge the audience. Um, who are anybody listening and watching this? Uh, if you want to make a difference, find a kid uh, of color, a woman, um, somebody who ordinarily would not even have an opportunity to to do any of this stuff we're talking about because they don't, you know, they don't even know it exists. As Naya said and help them sign up for a NASA internship or help them 
sign up for a Lockheed internship or help them go to a camp that's in their neighborhood because they are there. And one of the one of the frustrating things is to have programs that are set out for African American kids and have nobody apply. That's really really frustrating. To have scholarships that are available that go un you know un unrequested. So I, I would challenge the audience if if you know a young kid, uh, black white, I don't care what color to be quite honest, but grab them and help them fill out the paperwork. Don't just tell them about it, but help them fill out the paperwork. Otherwise, you're you know you're you're trifling. I apologize. But like I said, I'm an angry black man right now. <laughs> Thank you all. I really hope to see that change in the years going forward. So with a little over 30 minutes left in the panel, we're going to transition into questions specific to panelists that audience members have sent in. So the first is for General Bolden. What specific progress have you seen in racial diversity, inclusion, equity, justice in the aerospace industry during your career? Was the change continuous or gradual, or did it come in large spurts? What concrete actions were the most effective in generating this change? Uh, over my lifetime in, in aerospace, the change is always cyclical, unfortunately. And, and that's, I think that's the story of everything. However, um, I what I have seen is that the numbers increase with every cycle. Um, for example, when I was the NASA administrator, at one time we had uh, three women who were center directors of NASA centers. Um, today, I gotta think about it, I could be wrong, we have none. Uh, so we can't do that. You know, you can't, um, I, we have had one black administrator of NASA, uh, one, doesn't really count. Being the first is not important if they're not seconds and thirds and fourths. So I, I, we've got to get, it's always going to be cyclical, but we've got to get the cycles closer together and we've got to get the number to continue to grow with, with each cycle um, when you do that. But, I, but I, I was incredibly proud when we selected the class of 2013 of NASA astronauts because it was the first time in any organization, technical organization, I'd ever been involved in it had 50-50 women and men. So we picked eight out of, I don't know how many thousands, how many tens of thousands, and, and it was just 50-50. All of them now but one has flown in space. Uh, most people who follow the space program know their names because it's Jessica Muir, Christina Koch, Anne McLean, and then Nicole Mann is getting ready to fly on the first Boeing uh, commercial human-rated spacecraft. So. They are becoming household names. Christina and Jessica were the first two women to do an all-female spacewalk. Christina was the first woman to spend a year in space. So, you know, they're, they're not spending their time trying to demonstrate, trying to talk to people uh, about why they're there. They're just doing it. And that's what I think we, we all have to do. So I'm incredibly positive about where we are for the first time ever. Uh, we have a woman heading human spaceflight in NASA, Kathy Luters, who um, who is responsible uh, for getting us to the to the success of of SpaceX's commercial humans launch with with Demo Two because she she was the first and only uh, program manager we had for the commercial crew program until we flew that flight and and as a result of that she's now been promoted to take over for as the head of all human spaceflight in NASA the head the chief. Uh, flight director down at the Johnson Space Center today is Holly Ridings, who's a, who's a young woman who came up through the ranks. So I say that to say, I think the future is, is bright, but when we have only 65 out of 565 people who've flown in space that are female, uh, we got a long way to go. When we have way less than that who are black, who have flown in space, we got a long way to go. So we've just got to keep hammering away at it because we're doing okay, but we're not doing what I would call well because we're, you know, the cycle continues to go and, and we want we want the peaks to get higher as we go through and we want the cycles, the, the peaks to come closer and closer together. It's six o'clock. Thank you so much. So our next question is for Naya, um, particularly when it comes to supporting minority students in graduate programs. 
At the graduate level, do you feel that it's better for universities to focus on the recruitment of diverse students or of creating or maintaining a culture that welcomes and supports the diverse populations already present? Sure. Um, so I definitely want to say it definitely should never be an either or. I think it's very irresponsible to recruit students that you don't have a system in place for. Um, I, I think that can end up doing a lot of damage to the actual student. But yes, they should absolutely be things that should be done in tandem or together. Um, however, if you find that your, your system or your institution has never graduated, for an example, a black you know, PhD student, maybe you should look inward before you go and, and reach for more um, diverse talent just because you can do a lot more damage to that student um, than good for your program. And so um, I think uh, I think just in general, a lot of institutions, grad programs, et cetera, need to look inward and, and look at their own statistics, their own track record and say, okay, how many have we graduated? How many, well, how many have we recruited and got in? How many have we graduated and actually made successful? Um, and if those numbers are not equal or not um, aligning well, then there needs to be a substantial amount of work internally um, before you continue to bring more students into potentially very harmful environments. Thank you so much. So for our undergraduate students on this pa panel, Kaylin and Aliyah, do you feel comfortable addressing your professors or classmates when they exhibit microaggressions? Um, I personally do. I think it's really hard though to shy away from the angry black woman like um, stereotype because it's like, I, I wanna say something, but I know because of that stereotype associated with it, it's like, okay, I don't wanna come off as too aggressive. So I have to tell myself like legit like eight times, like, all right, this is how I'm gonna say this. And this is how it's gonna be said, but I have to do it so quickly, especially because you don't wanna wait to after the fact to call it out. And so it's hard to, really not be full on like, like, who are you talking to? But it's like, okay, I can't do that. Like, this is not the space to do that. So definitely just making sure that I address the problem correctly has definitely made me more open to addressing things because I know beforehand, I just, because I knew like I was gonna be on team, I just wouldn't say anything. But just knowing how to appropriately handle situations, it's definitely pushed me to be like, okay, this needs to be said because I don't want this to happen to anybody else and I don't want it to happen to me again. So just making sure that you're comfortable addressing it. Yeah, piggybacking, piggybacking off of what Aaliyah said, um, at my school, there's a 3% black population. And sadly, it keeps going down. But um, so that whole angry black woman stereotype is something that sadly has pushed me back from addressing stuff or addressing stuff seriously. So. I I had a problem with one of my friends where they would say stuff all the time and I have to kind of like jokingly approach them because I would be scared to like, you know, be assertive, be serious and be like, um, yeah, that's not right. Or I have, so I'd have to like do it in a jokingly manner. But what I realized is they still didn't get it. Like joking with someone isn't, it's not, it doesn't work, sadly. It doesn't work at all. And so it came to a point where I did have to adjust. And this was a classmate. I had to adjust and be serious, be honest with them. And I lost a friend at the end of the day, but I feel better that I spoke up for myself. And so I would tell people, anyone who's listening, don't try to be joking or don't try to joke with it. Be serious, be assertive. That whole angry black woman stereotype, it sucks, but you have to stand up for yourself. You cannot let people walk over you because I've done it too many times, sadly. I'm going to my junior year and I've done it too many times. And so I would always encourage you to stand up for yourself no matter what. And also just ensuring that you're assertive and not aggressive in every situation because whenever you react instead of respond to a situation, it like pivots off to something that could have just easily been resolved. Thank you both for standing up in what must have been a very difficult and uncomfortable situation. So going off of what you guys were saying about this discomfort in standing up to perpetrators who, do, who say and do things that are microaggressions. General Bolton, is there a professional way to stand up to microaggressions without being labeled as, quote, difficult to work with? What if those aggressions come from a higher up? Um, I think 
frequently the aggressions come from higher up and and it's because they feel that that uh, nobody's going to challenge them so um about the best way that i can think of to deal with it is to find the appropriate organization in your inside your organization where you can go and and uh, at least make it known that that you think an issue uh, exists. Um, hopefully, you're in an organization again, like I tried to make NASA when I was there, where the, the diversity champion is the leader. I, I considered myself the diversity champion for NASA and and everybody in the agency and all of our all of our contractors knew it, and so they knew that that was really important to me, and that if I, I used a model from the Marine Corps. We have something that we call uh, request may ask. And it's the lowest ranking pr private in the Marine Corps can say, I want to go talk to the general. And, and I, I'm being abused, I'm being harassed, uh, I'm being discriminated against, and my command is not responding to my needs. So I want to go talk to the general. And, and it's a formal process. And uh, if anybody stops, or tries to stop that person in, in, you know, in along the process, and the general finds out about it, then the people in the middle are really in trouble. So what it does is it really encourages everybody in mid-level management or leadership to try to solve problems as opposed to allowing things to languish. So, so I would say if if you don't complain, if you don't file the complaint in the first place, we're never going to know about it. We can't fix anything that we don't know about we can't fix a problem if we don't know it exists and uh so I, I we should not we cannot lose this opportunity when people seem to be attuned to to um to hearing and acting on issues that that you all are bringing forward and again i i, I hate to throw it back to your generation but but you're the only ones that have that have complained persistently and seem to be courageous enough to stand up and take the heat uh, and so again, I will I will emphasize. I, I think you know I want to commend AIAA and the women of, of aeronautics and astronautics for putting this this forum on. Um, you know, under Dan Dunbacher and previously under Sandy Magnus, that's the leadership in AIAA that said we want to make a difference. We want to we want to see if how we bring about diversity in these organizations. But but those are examples of two leaders, two people who were the executive directors or whatever you call them. NAIAA that's that said this is my policy and uh, so you all have got to insist that that you demand that they do what what they said they were going to do thank you so much Naya just from this past hour I can already tell how passionate you are about pipelining stem especially the areas that don't necessarily have those kinds of resources so the next question for you is what can undergraduate and graduate students do on campus to promote diversity in clubs or engineering if that is not a priority for school administration? How can they make their individual organizations more welcoming to minorities? Great question. Um, I definitely think actively reaching out to Black students, especially if you realize that your organization is more homogenous looking, um, I know when I started undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate degree, I apologize for the sirens in the background, uh, live in Atlanta, very busy place. <laughs> um, but uh, I know when I, I spent my first week attending um, or, organizational clubs that for my, for my first year there, and I would walk into places and be the only one, obviously, and I would be super intimidated and just want to walk out sometimes. And so um, I definitely wouldn't have gone to those on my own unless I continue to push myself the way that I did. And so something that I noticed was um, beneficial and that I implemented when I got into leadership in organizations like NSBE um, and you know Society of Women in Space Exploration, I would collaborate with Black organizations too. So I, um, I'm, I'm always a big fan of like doing things together instead of doing things separate. So I did collaborations between Nesby and say like the Rocket Club so that Nesby students had access to the Rocket Club and can get their high parts um, rocket tree certifications and all that good stuff. And then they would go and attend the meetings on their own if they enjoyed that organization. So um, if you can't reach every um, black or minority student on campus, find, uh, you know, Nesby is a great one, OBAP, which is an organization for black aerospace professionals. 
um, even like a CSA, Caribbean Student Association, African Student Association, collaborate with those, um, you know, those minority organizations and provide those same opportunities that you do to your, to your groups. Um, so that's my two cents. Thank you, that was really insightful. For our two undergraduate panelists, how important is it to you that Black recruiters come to your campus? If for whatever reason a company decides it can only send white recruiters, is that better than no recruiters? What do you wish you could say to those white recruiters? Um, honestly, I don't know if I'm gonna shake the table a little bit with this one, but the fact that like recruiters will come and they'll have like one black person to just talk to the black students, it's kind of just like, I don't think I want to work for this company because it's like we kind of caught on to the game by now. It's just like, all right, really, like the black person is going to approach me and call me over to the table. Like, OK, but just being that, like, I feel like we would be more open to these opportunities if you just send a diverse group of people. Like, I don't even think I've ever had a woman recruiter approach me until I went to this last conference. So it was kind of just like really refreshing. And she was a minority as well. So just sending diverse groups of people rather than, okay, well, let me just have this one black male approach this black woman to inform her on these opportunities that my company has. Yeah, I 100% agree. I was gonna say the same thing. Um, definitely just a whole diverse, diverse group of people, you know, we're not stupid, you know? So sending that one black person to make sure to reach these one black student, I mean, one black student, it's like, that still kind of makes you feel a little bit isolated. So when you send a diverse group of people, again, it's a reflection of your company. It's a reflection of your organization. And so we'll make sure that, make sure you have the diversity, but when you send the diversity, it makes me feel more wanted and more respected. And like, I'm not just like some bargaining chip or I'm a chip in the game, you know? It's like, you want me. So at the end of the day, that's what really matters. Thank you so much. So back to General Bolton. Um, you mentioned a lot about uh, this entire panel, actually, the theme of how this disconnect between social issues and engineering has been there and how that's not true at all. And we really need to consider these social issues, especially moving forward with space explorations. So General Bolton, what do you think is the work being done to prevent our racial issues on Earth from becoming issues in our space exploration missions? How do we keep the oppressive nature of racism out of our new frontier beyond our planet? One of the one of the biggest, yeah, I won't call it a complaint, but one of the biggest complaints I, I would get from people when we started talking about Mars uh, while I was an NASA administrator was, why the heck are we gonna go to Mars and take the problems from Earth? We, we already screwed Earth up. And, and they were talking about environmental issues as well as human interaction issues. But they were saying, we've already screwed Earth up. Why should we go screw up another planet? Um, I, I, in my defense, my, my response would be going to Mars or going to any other place other than Earth does not, does not excuse us from straightening out this planet. We really do need to focus on the environment here where we live because I hate to tell people, but we are not going to, humanity is not going to move to Mars. Uh, contrary to what Elon Musk says, we are not going to colonize Mars. And you're not going to see people migrate there to live out the rest of their lives. This is the only planet that we know today and that any of us will ever experience in our lifetimes uh, that can sustain human life in a normal, acceptable way. So let's get it straight. Let's clean up the environment. We messed it up. Let's clean it up. We messed up our internet, our interpersonal relations. Let's get that straightened out. So this gives us an excellent opportunity to work on human relations, to work on the environment and work on everything. And we've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We can't, you know, we can't isolate and say, okay, this week we're going to work on uh, diversity. And next week we're going to work on the environment. They all go together. I, you know, Victor Glover, who's getting ready to fly, uh, this, the first operational SpaceX mission as a NASA astronaut, who happens to be a, he's a black Navy commander, uh, fighter pilot, who is gonna be on the, on the next crew to fly a SpaceX mission. And, and Victor got a lot of heat because um, on Twitter, 
somebody, he, he mentioned something about Black Lives Matter and somebody came back and said, hey, can't you just talk about space? And Victor said, I'd love to, but I can't because space is human beings. It's not, we're not, we're talking about sending humans to space. And so that means we've got to be able to work together. I've got to be able to, to trust the people who are preparing the spacecraft for me. They've got to be able to trust that I'm going to execute the, the experiments and everything else that they send me into space to do. So we've got to talk about people before we can talk about space because space is people. And I, I thought Victor was incredible in doing that. And, you know, the good thing is, at least for now, the astronaut office is backing him up and is supporting him. But there's another guy named Emmanuel Ochoa, who is a former NFL football player. And some of you may have seen him, but he has a thing that's called, and it's on YouTube, and it, I think it's called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. And, and he, like Victor, had said, hey, look, uh, I'm just like you. I know that there are some uncomfortable things that, that you don't know how to deal with. How about asking me the question? And let's have a discussion. Uh, rather than you assuming that I feel this way or that I hate you or that I'm holding you accountable for what your ancestors did, can we talk about it? And so, you know, that's, that's something that, that your generation seems to be more open to. Several of you have talked before about listening. Um, I think people are afraid that they're going to come in the room and we're going to make demands on them. Well, yeah, we are, but we're also going to listen first before we, we characterize or formulate our demands. There are some demands to be made, but we do need to listen to the other side, if there is an other side, and, and hear what their fears are, what their anxieties are, because in many cases, they're just afraid. And they're afraid that we're going after what they have, because they have this this, um, you know, it's, it's a zero sum game. Uh, if you get something, I'm losing something. Well, life is not like that. You know, it's nuanced. And so we can help them get more if they help us to get more. So, you know, whatever. Thank you. Naya, what do you think institutions could be doing to encourage students to specifically pursue a research track in grad school? Um, as an example, whether that's continuing on for a PhD rather than just finishing with a master's degree. Um, I think just giving them a well-rounded education about the benefits and disadvantages of pursuing a PhD or research track PhD um, I personally don't think everybody needs one just because I've heard an industry where, um, you know, some people have been denied jobs because they have a PhD to the point where they were overqualified. And so I think a lot of people don't know that and will think that every job, you know, is going to pay more for somebody with a PhD and, and et cetera, et cetera. And maybe they go for, you know, I guess th they pursue a PhD for the reason of not just pursuing one because maybe they want more money or maybe they, um, Think it'll do them better in the industry when in fact that not um that not may always that may not always be the case <laughs> there we go um and so so me personally i i would have liked and and i think i got a pretty good understanding of it through organizations like the mcnair scholars program i was able to understand all the benefits and disadvantages of going through with a phd um but a lot of people have misconceptions about it and some people may have a passion just to do that and then obviously you should encourage it but there are a lot of pitfalls and disadvantages that come with, um, you know, going further into higher education that a lot of people may not be aware of. So um, to put it shortly, is a, a well-rounded education around uh, what it means to get a PhD. Thank you so much. So for our undergraduate panelists, and you guys kind of touched on this with the last question that was asked to you, where can we draw the line between tokenism and representation if we were the leader of an aerospace organization and wanted to implement an aerospace event themed on diversity? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, that's a tough one, but I think, you know, when it comes to diversity, diversity and things like that, especially with people that throw events. I was talking to our DNI diversity and inclusion committee the other day. You always you have to think about not only you know acknowledging people's struggles, but also celebrating the things that they celebrate. 
So like Juneteenth, for example, was an, a holiday that we had a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, that was a lot of people, a lot more people knew about it. But, you know, what if you had events focused on the celebratory type of things that happen in the Black community in different communities? And I think sometimes people only kind of focus doing events when it happens to be a big thing in the social issue type of genre. And it's like, if you really want to show that you actually stand for diversity, you actually stand for inclusion, you know, you should be doing these things all year round. And I think that if you do these things all the time, if you not only focus on the issues, but the celebratory moments in these communities, that shows that, okay, I'm just not a token here. Like, I'm here to stay. These people care about me. These people care about what I can bring to this company. They care about my culture. They care about the things that I care about, not just, you know, the oppression that we have, but also the celebratory things that we have, the cool holidays that we have, the amazing people that this culture puts out. And so when doing that, I feel like we kind of get rid of this like tokenism type of effect. You get you promote an environment of actual diversity and actual inclusion and lets people know that you are this is how you are 24 seven. I think Kaylin hit the nail right on the head with everything that she said. All right, thank you. So back to General Bolden. So our next question to you, and you've talked a lot about the importance that millennials and Gen Z have in the years forward in the fight against racial injustice, but as millennials and Gen Z come of age to run for office and assume leadership positions, what policy or changes, whether that's legislative and cor or corporate, would be the most effective at dismantling the current system of systemic racism? You know, I I wish I had an answer, and uh, and I I have to I have to beg forgiveness because I knew this question was coming, and I just couldn't come up with a a specific answer. But I but I will say that um, I I'm not sure that 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 legislation will trump and i hate that no pun intended there but but i i don't think that legislation will exceed the value of leadership um and it begins with voting so we have an opportunity to make the first changes in november uh you know every everybody who is eligible to vote should go out and vote so so let me get on a soapbox here um, you know, if you if you want policies that that are in consonance with what you believe, then you elect people who share your beliefs. And that means all the way down to the local level, the city council and, and pay attention when you vote in November, pay attention to the down ballot. Uh, you know, I don't I'm a person that votes for people. I don't vote for a party. Uh, I try to pick somebody who thinks. Uh, who wants to make the same kind of changes that I want to make, who wants to give the same kind of advantages to, to all people that I want to give. And, and those are the ones that I vote for. So that, that would be the first thing that I would say we need to do is we need to vote and put people in office who are going to at least discuss what policies or laws need to be enacted. Um, we, need to re, we need to make sure that everybody, we need to reenact, or what, I, I, forget, I don't know what the proper terminology is, but we need to make it very clear that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is the law and that it stands so that there is no, you know, people don't mess around with the vote, that everybody, everybody understands the, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments that give people the right to vote and equal representation. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that, that we need to do. There's not a lot of new stuff that needs to come to, to, come to the fore. We just need to enforce the laws that you know, our forefathers put on the books that gave us the right to vote, that gave us the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that made us a whole person instead of three-fifths of a person. Those things have already been taken care of. It's just we've allowed people to, to whittle away at that and take it away from us. So you put people in office uh, who understand you know, what, what, remember when I talked about the little girl with the thing that said the system isn't broken, uh, it's the way it was designed. We've got to redesign the system such that it does the kinds of things that we want it to do. Don't try to work within today's system. Try to rebuild the system such that it, it works the way that we want it to work for all people. So that would be, those would be some of the things that I would, I would say we do. 
Thank you so much. I hope we all remember just how important voting is, especially in the November election. So Naya, how do you address racism or bias when it comes to applying for grants and fellowships? I actually, I think I have the same issue General Bolden mentioned that, you know, I don't know if that's an answer I have <laughs> just because I've never been on the back end of, <laughs> of those fellowships. I, I see accepted or rejected. And so, so maybe that's a problem in and of itself that transparency is not a thing when it comes to um, reviewing grants. I've been fortunate in some areas and I've been unfortunate in others. And um, and so I, I, I don't know how things work on the back end. I don't know how we're graded um, in, in each area. I don't know if there's a rubric. And so I think maybe we can start there as being more transparent about how we're graded, what and by what rubric are we graded on? And then two is how are the reviewers chosen? <laughs> because my assumption is that you, you can't, well, my assumption is that there's no unconscious bias training for reviewers uh, before they take on that role. And me personally, I know that, um, you know, we have to talk about our outreach efforts and, and maybe things that we've done outside of school. Well, do these reviewers also do things outside of their academics or are they chosen solely because of their merit? Um, so, how, so how can you review me on something that you don't do? Um, and that's just something that I don't know as a graduate student, as a person on the other side of these grants and these fellowships um, that I would like to know and would hopefully, you know, like to be more confident in the fact that I'm getting a fair and objective um, review of my submission. Can I, can I add just one, one quick thing to what Naya just said, and it's, you know, um, you all, or we all live, we don't live in a bubble. Uh, the aerospace community is a bubble. And because we're black, because we're people of color, we're not allowed to live in that bubble because when we go home, we go out into society and we worry about being arrested, being shot, being assaulted, uh, all kinds of things that, that people of color face every single day in their lives. And our white counterparts don't experience that. One of the things we can do to help them is to take them in, you know, take them home with us, not literally, but, but figuratively. Say, look, let's have a conversation about my life. I don't live in your bubble. Uh, when I go out, I may leave here and I may go, if I live in DC, I may go down to Black Lives Matter Plaza and hold up a placard. You're probably not gonna do that. You're gonna go home and you're gonna have dinner and you're gonna work about, you're gonna worry about your project or whatever it is you're working on. You're gonna go to work tomorrow and do the same thing. But we need to get them engaged and get them involved and help them understand that it's as much their issue as it is ours. And we all need to work it together. So they need to come out of the bubble with us and they need to be cognizant of the things that are going on outside of aerospace if they really wanna make our community stronger and stronger and stronger, because we all know that diversity makes us incredibly strong. Uh, it, it makes us incredibly resilient and it gives us a power uh, that, that people just can't even imagine. Thank you for the additional insight. So for our undergraduate, panelists how do you carry yourself at internships are you comfortable expressing your knowledge without trying to come off as uppity um so my mentor she actually instilled in me to be comfortable saying that i don't know because like we talked about earlier in the conversation our generation like we're so arrogant to the point where it's like i don't want anybody to think that i don't know something but I had to come to curse with the fact that I don't know everything like I'm only 20 so it was just like I had to be comfortable with asking like they would say especially in the aerospace industry there's all these acronyms and when I say I would literally be like I don't know what that means like I'm sorry but can you like break that down like I need like a list like I literally had a notebook breaking down every acronym but at first it was kind of uncomfortable but I had to be the one to actually not be afraid to admit that I don't know something because as my mentor told me, people respect you so much more by saying you don't know rather than you acting like you know everything because it's like, what are you an intern for if you already know? So just being comfortable with, okay, I really honestly don't know. Just, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with saying I don't know something, so. 
Acronyms are an example of micro invalidation. Uh, when I was the NAS administrator, people knew that when we went into meetings, I always said, look, I hate acronyms. And I know NASA lives and dies on acronyms. But at least the first time out, tell me what this acronym means. Because in NASA, we had, we had any number of acronyms that had multiple meanings. And if you got the wrong meaning, it could be disastrous for somebody. So I, you, you know, do not like, Ayala said, tell me your name again. I've been calling you all kinds of names today. Pronounce your name for me if you would. So I get it right. Aaliyah, is, is that correct? Yes, Aaliyah. Okay, I, want, I just wanted to make sure. But, but it, it's like Aaliyah said, don't be embarrassed to say, I don't know. I, I was the number one question answerer in the agency for my eight years as the NASA administrator. I was the dumb guy in the room. I, I went into every meeting and I would say, look, I am not the smartest person in this room on purpose. I tried to surround myself with really smart people uh, from whom I could learn and from whom I could get counsel. Um, there is strength in being able to say, I don't know. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. So can we back up <laughs> you know, and help me? If you're in a room with 20 people, there are 19 other people that are going, Phew. Well, 18, because the person who said what it was you didn't understand, that may be the only person that understands what the heck they're talking about, but nobody else has the courage to, to ask up. So, I mean, you can never go wrong by saying, I don't know. I, I, I apologize. I don't know what that acronym means. So I don't know what you're talking about. Help me here because I wanna, I, I'm a part of this team and I wanna really understand and I wanna be able to contribute, but I can't, I can't contribute if I, don't, if I don't have a clue what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, just to chime on really quickly to add on, also, don't be afraid to say that I don't know to your superiors, but also to your peers. I worked with this amazingly smart guy, and he was the same age as me, and he knew, like, everything. Like, I was surprised he was an engineer already. I'm like, he just knew everything about everything. And he would just shoot and go off and go off and go off on tangents, and he, like, read, you know, Einstein's favorite books in his free time. Like, it was crazy. Like, this guy was amazingly smart. And we're really good friends. But he loved acronyms. He loved just shooting off and shooting off and going. And at times, I'm like, well, we're the same age. We're in the same grade. Should I be doing something different about my life? You know, I don't know, like, half of what this guy knows. And so don't be afraid with your peers, people that are the same age as you or younger with you don't be afraid to say hey um i don't know or like hey i'm learning this new software program how did you learn it how did you get proficient in it can you give me some resources some books some you know help on here or how do i you know do this how do i implement that i saw you've done this before let me know so i really think with me it's it's a peer thing too so superiors yes but definitely with the peers and people who are your age and also, like really quickly, just saying you don't know will release so much stress from your life because you'll be sitting there after the clock trying to figure out how you're about to do this project because you pretended like you knew how to do it and you didn't know how to do it. So just saying like, I don't know how to do something will literally save you the time, space and energy to where you'll get a good night's sleep because you know like, okay, I have someone that's going to help me rather than you're sitting here pretending like you know what you're doing when in reality, the project's gonna end up being late because you gotta do a crash course on how to do it. Like, it's just too much, like just too much internal stress that goes on rather than just being upfront, honest, open and transparent, just being like, you know, I honestly don't know how to do something and that's okay. A, a quick admission as, as the only male on this panel, uh, going back to what Aaliyah just said. And, I, and, and this, is, we, this is proven from years of being in, in, in this technical community, if ever, a male is asked to take on a task, hand goes up, I got it. Don't have a clue. I mean, no clue about what they're gonna do or whether they can really do it, but I got it. Young women or women, period, are always very measured and very careful before they say, I'll take that task because they, you don't wanna run the risk of not being able to do it. That's okay. But, but, but be careful that you, you cut yourself out of some things by saying, look, I don't fully understand this, but I want to take that on. I mean, you know, make the caveat. I, I want to lead that team, but I got to learn some things. And so I need to surround myself with, with very talented people. If they pick, 
if they choose not to pick you, then at least you've been honest, which is what males very seldom do. Males just say, I can do it. Well, it looks like we are just about out of time. Um, a huge shout out to the diversity and inclusion chairs, including Kaylin, for putting this together and providing the opportunity for so many people in our communities to learn and grow themselves and to really understand the plight of the Black community, especially in this day and age. And of course, a huge thank you to all of our panelists. You all are so inspirational, and I am sure the audience feels the same way and really enjoyed the insight you brought into this panel. And thank you again for being very vulnerable and honest about the experiences that you've all been through and being so brave about things that you guys have experienced. And Nuwoa wishes you all very well. I wish you very well. And I hope to see you guys doing so many more great things in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.